हेलो डॉक्टर मिलाप हैज ज्वाइंड हैज डॉक्टर लिपिका ज्वाइंड हेलो कैन यू हियर मी हेलो सर डॉक्टर लिपिका हैज नॉट येट ज्वाइंड सर हाँ बट यू कैन हियर मी राइट यस सर ओके थैंक यू so what we can do dr milap should we switch the order then because if dr lipika has, have we contacted her hello sir so ask the secretary at office and get back to you ha huh, please uh, see now if they if uh, she is joining or not otherwise we'll have to switch and do dr milap's talk first or we can continue with the same order but you know provided that she is definitely going to join dr milap's video has been tested na it has sir, been recorded sir switch on your video acha hai hello डॉक्टर मिला आप कैन यू स्विच ऑन योर वीडियो हाँ देर गो परफेक्ट सो यू आर विजिबल एंड ऑडियो चेक Huh? Dr. Milap, can you say something? We'll just check your audio if it your whether. Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, we can hear you. Nice. Okay. Thank you. There you go. Wonderful, Doctor Lipika is joined. <laughs> Hello, ma'am. Hi, Doctor V. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. अच्छा तो ठीक है, so it's six twenty nine, so we'll start at six thirty. हाँ हाँ हाँ. So uh, first we will have your uh, talk, uh, uh, recorded talk transmitted, then Doctor Milaps, and then we will open it for everybody for discussion. Q and A. Okay. Okay. So around six fifty, I should be. No, 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 no. You have remain online, huh? No, no. I am online, but <laughs> my audio on. Karungi. I, I because exactly twenty minutes each, so it's around six forty only. Ah ha. वो मेरी बेटी का twelfth boards है ना twenty second से तो audio off करके उसको इधर उधर monitor करूँ. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so. So seventeen people have this uh, thing. So um, we'll start off then, huh? Uh, uh, team, are you ready for starting the talk?
so we'll start off then so uh, welcome everybody this is one of the unique initiatives of isot and the first of its kind where a, a liver transplant pathology course is being organized uh, so far we have had parts of and bits of it in uh, the isot conferences and some liver transplant conferences also but this is a initiative where, which is very important uh, as the expertise and experience of uh, liver transplant pathology is very limited in our country uh, at this point and uh, as the number of transplant centers in india are increasing we would like more and more people to uh, develop this expertise and be very comfortable with it. Uh, so uh, to start off, there are uh, two uh, session talks today. And all of you who have joined the course are going to be receiving certificates at the end of uh, all sessions during the ISOT annual conference, as um, you're aware. So today's uh, session has two talks. The first one is by Dr. Lipika. She is a senior consultant uh, pathologist at Medanta. Um, she will, uh, her talk will cover introduction to liver morphology. And the second talk is by Dr. Milab Shah, who is the head of um, histopathology at Yashoda Hospital in Hyderabad. And his talk will cover frozen section and donor evaluation. At the end of both talks, we will have a question answer session. So please feel free to uh, pose your questions in the chat box um, and we will take them up uh, at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Lipika's talk first. Ma'am, start. Good evening, everyone. The first uh, chapter in this uh, course is Introduction to Liver Morphology, which um, is a sort of introduction to how the liver uh, is organized uh, macroscopically as well as microscopically. And we will, I'll just highlight a few basic terms that you will come across in this entire lecture. So liver is the largest organ of our body besides skin. It is divided into right lobe, left lobe, caudate lobe and quadrate lobe. And macroscopically, it is divided into eight segments. Segment 2, 3, 4A and 4B are in left lobe. Segment 1 is caudate lobe. Segment 5, 6, 7 and 8 are in right lobe. Radiologists usually mention lobes while describing lesions. So when you get a um, hepatectomy specimen specifying where your tumor is, then if you have a fair idea of where the lobes are, you will be able to localize the lesions. Microscopically, liver is surrounded by a capsule, a fibrous capsule which is lined by mesothelial cells and underlying which you have the hepatic parenchyma. The uh, Subcapsular surface of the liver is very fibrotic. So if you get a superficial biopsy, then there will be erroneous interpretation of fibrosis. So you ensure that your clinician sends you or a radiologist sends you a good deep biopsy of the liver. Microscopically, liver is organized into three different schematic structures. The classic hepatic lobule, the portal lobule, and the hepatic a sinus. Coming to the classic hepatic lobule or the Rappaport's lobule as we know, it is hexagonal in shape and is based on blood flow. The corners of the hexagon are occupied by portal tract while the center is occupied by central vein. The portal lobule in contrast is triangular in shape and is based on bile flow. The corners of the triangle are occupied by central vein while the center is occupied by portal tract. The flow of bile is in opposite direction to the flow of blood. In liver, blood flows from portal tract to central vein while bile flows from hepatocytes to canals of heading to bile duels to interlobular bile ducts, then intrahepatic ducts, 
right and left hepatic ducts which join to form the common hepatic duct joins with cystic duct to form cbd and thus bile drains into duodenum hepatic acinus is another schematic representation of the liver histology which is based on blood perfusion throughout the liver parenchyma acinus is diamond shaped the axis of which is the corners of the long axis is occupied by central vein while the corners of short axis is occupied by portal triad acinus arbitrarily is divided into three zones zone 1 zone 2 and zone 3 zone 1 is the periportal zone which is which receives the most oxygenized blood zone 3 is the centrilobular or perivenular zone which receives the less uh, the least oxygenized blood the zone in between zone 1 and zone 2 is uh, zone uh, 3 is zone 2 here you can see in a hepatic lobule this is zone 1 the periportal zone which is which receives the most nutrients this is zone 2 and zone 3 is the centrilobular zone the arrow this red arrow shows blood flow from portal tract to central vein while the green arrow shows the bile flow from central vein to portal tract now coming to liver core you should receive adequate liver core which should be long enough should have enough portal tracts and should be of adequate thickness for interpretation very thin liver biopsies are also very easy difficult to interpret so adequate liver biopsy should be more than one centimeter long and should be from deeper parenchyma section should be cut at four microns or thinner wherever possible one or two deeper sections should be examined so that all the portal tracts have been viewed if possible he should be accompanied by empty wherever required after you have seen the h and e you decide whether you want to put any uh, special stain like pas prussian blue or or sin serious red congo red depending on the morphology ihc is limited the use of ihc is limited in liver but in transplant pathology, IHC can be ordered, CMV, IHC, CK7, C4D, etc. after viewing H and E. This is how a liver core looks when you look at it under a microscope. This is the central vein area or the zone 3 area. This is the portal triad or portal track. In between portal uh, track and central vein lies the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes are polygonal cells with granular cytoplasm, centrally placed vesicular nucleus, and you can find prominent nucleolus. Usually one cell has one nucleus, but there can be some binucleated cells also. The hepatocytes are arranged in normal cases in one cell plate thickness. In regenerative liver, you can have two cell plate thickness, but more than two, a neoplastic etiology should be suspected. This is the reticulin stain highlighting the cell plate thickness, which is of one cell thick. Liver is a very reticulin rich organ. If you do not find reticulin, either your reticulin stain is not working or you are looking at a neoplastic pathology. Coming to this schematic diagram of how the liver histology is organized, you can see this is the portal triad with the three structures here, bile duct, portal vein, and hepatic artery. Here is the central vein. You have cords of hepatocytes that are radiating from portal tract to central vein. The bile canaliculi separates one surface of the hepatocytes. These are lined by membrane and they facilitate transport of bile from canals of herring into the bile duct. The other surface of the hepatocytes, two cords of hepatocytes created by sinusoids. Now let's shift our attention to this diagram. This, uh, these are the hepatocytes. The microvillous surface of the hepatocytes faces the sinusoids. The sinusoids are lined by flattened, fenestrated endothelial cells 
that aid transport of nutrients from blood to the hepatocytes. They contain kufr cells. The space in between sinusoids and hepatocyte is known as space of Dissay. This space transports lymph. Space of Dissay also has the stellate cells or the itocells, which synthesize vitamin A. These are the cells that play crucial role in liver fibrosis. You can also find dendritic cells of the liver in space of Dissay. The other surface of hepatocyte encloses the bile canaliculi. This is the schematic diagram. Coming to the real time diagram or the histological picture of liver, these are cords of hepatocytes which are separated on one surface by the sinusoids lined by endothelial cells. The other surface encloses a hepatic canaliculi. They are very small structures and rarely visible if not prominent. This is another diagram showing a sinusoid which is lined by endothelial cells. Here you can make out a kufr cell. Kufr cells are normally not visible unless until activated by some inflammatory process. Now coming to the next structure of the liver, which is a portal tract or a portal triad. It is known as portal triad because it contains a hepatic uh, artery, a port bile duct, and a portal vein. This is the Mason trichrome stain that highlights a portal tract and here the structures are more visible. This is the portal vein, this is hepatic artery and this is bile duct. The lumen of hepatic artery and bile duct are usually of the same caliber and they develop from the same developmental sheath. They are near to each other in a portal tract. The bile duct is placed centrally within the portal tract and is lined by single layer of cuboidal cells, while the hepatic artery and portal vein, they are lined by endothelial cells. Hepatic artery is thicker than portal vein. Portal vein is larger than hepatic artery. Up to two to three bile ducts within a portal triad is normal. All these structures are embedded within a fibrous stroma in portal tract. They also contain, the portal tract contains sprinkling of occasional lymphocyte. Presence of occasional lymphocyte is normal within a portal tract. However, if you come across neutrophils and plasma cells within a portal tract, it is always pathological. Portal tract is separated from hepatocyte by a limiting plate. This dark line highlights the limiting plate of the portal tract. Limiting plate is the thin layer of hepatocyte that separates portal tract from uh, the rest of the liver parenchyma. It becomes important when you are dealing with chronic hepatitis, especially autoimmune hepatitis is where the plate is destroyed and you find interface activity or inflammation. So now we come to certain terms that we will come across, that you all will come across while discussing liver pathology in transplant. First term is ballooning degeneration. What is ballooning degeneration? These are enlarged hepatocytes which are significantly bigger than these adjacent hepatocytes. They show clear and flocculent cytoplasm. Nucleus will be central, but this cytoplasm will not have fat. In contrast to these cells, these are fat containing hepatocytes or steatosis. Whereas ballooning degeneration, you do not have fat, but you have a flocculent cytoplasm. They may or may not have malary highline. In liver pathology, this term is restricted to hepatitic pathology. Next analogy is feathery degeneration. What is feathery degeneration? This is very similar to ballooning degeneration, wherein the hepatocyte will be enlarged, swollen, pale, and will contain thready, wispy structures in the cytoplasm. And you may find bile within the liver. 
feathery hepatos hepatocyte feathery degeneration starts in the periportal area it is usually restricted to chronic cholestatic pathology to indicate retention of bile salts or cholate stain if you have seen stain in these cases you will have the classic cola colored or sin granules within the feathery uh, hepatocytes next terminology that you will come across is portal and lobular inflammation i told you within the portal tract occasional lymphocyte is acceptable but if it is more than occasional and it is admixed with plasma cells eosinophils lymph uh, the neutrophils it is pathological inflammation within the portal tract is known as portion inflammation that is in the lobules is known as lobular inflammation this is another uh, photomicrograph highlighting the lobular inflammation. There are several foci of lobular, lobular inflammation. In certain lesions, we count this lobular inflammation per 10x, and in certain lesions, we count this lobular inflammation per 20x. This is another picture, this lymphocytic lobular inflammation, which are scattered throughout the lobules. Sometimes lobular inflammation can aggregate and cause activation of Kupffer cells and result in a microgranuloma. Next terminology that we come across in cases of liver uh, pathology is interface activity. I told you there was there is this limiting plate that separates portal triad from hepatocytes. So when this limiting plate is destroyed by inflammation and inflammation spills from portal area to the lobules, it is known as interphase activity. Interphase activity can be diffuse or can be focal. It is known as focal. The um, destruction of limiting plate is less than two thirds of the diameter of the portal area. And it is called diffuse if it is more than two thirds. This is a case of autoimmune hepatitis, wherein you can find diffuse interphase activity in this portal area. This is the portal tract. The limiting plate is entirely destroyed. You cannot see the limiting plate, which is obscured by this inflammation going into the lobules. Next, we will discuss the terms that we use in cases of necrosis. First is councilman body or acidophil body. These are single scattered hepatocyte within the parenchyma. How do they look? This is normal hepatocyte. These are dead hepatocytes. They have denser cytoplasm, very dead cytoplasm. Nucleus is usually absent, or if present, they will be very small, shrunken, and shriveled. They are usually seen in cases of drug-induced liver damage, in acute cellular rejection, acute viral infection, low-grade or transient ischemia spotty necrosis is, which is used when you find minute clusters of hepatocytes usually admixed with lymphocytes these are small foci of necrosis within the lobules zonal necrosis uh, this is the term is used when necrosis involves a particular zone in the liver sinus or the liver biopsy here you can see this is the portal area. The entire zone one hepatocyte is preserved, but zone two and zone three hepatocytes are destroyed with this hemorrhage and necrosis. This is a classical um, pattern of necrosis that results from uh, uh, hepatic vein thrombus or ischemia or drug related. Then confluent necrosis. Necrosis that involves multiple lobules, known as confluent necrosis. It can be seen in uh, extensive drug toxicity, for example, in acetaminophen poisoning, in acute viral or autoimmune hepatitis, in acute uh, allograft failure, and in fulminant uh, hepatic failure. This necrosis occupies entire lobules. You will not find hepatocytes, but the remnant bile ductular structures will remain. Next terminology 
J is bile duct proliferation or reaction. These are the terms that are used interchangeably. So I told you duct is present within the center of the portal tract. The lumen of the duct will be similar to lumen of artery. Whereas ductules are present at the periphery of the portal tracts, the lumen, they are tubular structures with compressed lumen. Usually you uh, fail to see lumen of the ductules unless they are filled with bile. And these are the ter uh, term that is used in obstructive biliary pathology. You can find ductular proliferation or reaction in hepatitis and um, other conditions. Now, these are the ductules. You can see the lumen here because the lumen contains bile plugs. This is a classical pattern which is seen in cases of sepsis related changes. This is known as cholangitis lenta. You'll come across this term later. This ductular proliferation many a times, most of the times is accompanied by neutrophilic infiltrate. Presence of neutrophil outside the duct and within the portal stroma is normal because the cytokine response during ductular uh, proliferation, it, uh, it causes accumulation of neutrophil around the ducts. It is, this picture is not uh, indicative of cholangitis. What is cholangitis? Presence of neutrophil within the lumen of the duct is known as cholangitis. Next term that we, you will come across in liver pathology is steatosis. Accumulation of fat within the hepatic cytoplasm is known as steatosis. It can be microvesicular steatosis, it can be macrovesicular steatosis. When steatosis is accompanied, ballooning of hepatocytes along with presence of lobular inflammation, it is known as steatohepatitis. In cases of steatohepatitis and in ballooned hepatocytes, you may find malary hyaline. You can see this thick eosinophilic ropey structure in the cytoplasm. This is known as malary hyaline. Presence of malary hyaline says that this is a hepatitic, steatohepatitic process. You can find malary hyaline in both alcoholic steatohepatitis as well as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. But alcoholic steatohepatitis shows more malary hyaline. So this brings us to the end of uh, introduction to the liver morphology. So to conclude, we should have adequate clinical, biochemical and serological inputs before we start to interpret a liver biopsy. Ensure, request your clinician and radiologist that they should give you adequate liver biopsy if possible. You should cut thin sections and deeper sections. Sometimes the early sections may not show certain pathology that you will come across when you cut deeper sections. You the liver tissue should be used judiciously because liver biopsy is a very, very uh, dangerous. It's not a safe procedure. So you, whatever tissue has been given to you, try to use it judiciously. The key to reporting in cases of transplant pathology is rapid processing, fast and correct reporting because here the scope of error is minimal because the consequences can be dismal. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for a very lucid uh, uh, talk. We will uh, go ahead with Dr. Milap's talk and then we'll uh, take all questions in the end. There are two questions in the Q&A section, so we'll do that in the end, but let's uh, start with Dr. Milap's talk. Thank you. So start. 
Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Milab Shah from Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. This is my first lecture in this transplant pathology lecture series. We'll talk today on approach to the intraoperative or uh, uh, approach to the frozen sex on the liver biopsy. So, what is the role of frozen sex? So, it will help the surgeon to select the quality graph for the suitable recipient. It is absolutely necessary. Why? Because the poor quality graft is associated with the adverse outcome during the early transplant period, including the primary graft dysfunction or non-function, as well as the prolonged intensive care and the hospital stay for the patient. Or, on the other hand, when they reject the graft in, the, in this scenario, it is not judicious to reject or discard the organ unnecessarily because there is a scarcity of the organ. So, in which scenario will get the liver biopsy for the frozen section? Intraoperatively, sur surgeons feel that there is a subtle yellowish look of the liver, or there is a blunt nodular inferior border of the liver, or liver feels firm on palpation. So, surgeon will tell us kindly look for the degree of ketosis or fibrosis. Sometimes the liver enzymes are elevated, then in that scenario, the surgeon tells us to look for the degree of inflammation, fibrosis or necrosis. On palpation, the liver is non-blanching or it looks pale when and the, there is a history of prolonged hypotension or history of CPR or, pain, or the donor was on high dose of vasopressin. In that scenario, the surgeon will tell us to look for the zone 3 changes, especially to look for the necrosis. Or sometimes they'll feel any nodules or mass during the palpation. And that time also we'll get the biopsy for the frozen section evaluation. So this is how the fatty liver will look. The normally, this is the sharp inferior border will turn blunt and the liver looks pale yellow rather than the dark brown. So what the sample we need for the frozen section? Ideally, a 2 cm long, long needle core is the ideal thing. So two cores from each from the right and the left lobe are the sufficient. Rather than using the subcapsular weight biopsy, core biopsy is preferable. Or when there is a mass lesion, a separate biopsy from the background liver is also recommended to look for the any chronic liver disease. How do you transport this sample? Ideally, there should not be any fixative or the transport medium should be used. The sample must be transported immediately in a fresh condition in a cool environment and it should reach the lab within 20 minutes. Do not place the biopsy on a towel or a gauze because it can cause the fat to be released from the hepatocytes, resulting in an underestimation of the degree of ketosis. And also avoid using saline because it can cause the freezing artifacts or the water artifacts and it hampers the interpretation. Similarly, the drying also can induce the artifact and it causes the decreased amount of fat and compromise the accuracy of the interpretation. How do you process this biopsy? Once the biopsy reaches the lab, the tissue sample must be freeze gently. It should be placed on an OCT medium and freeze at minus 20 to minus 25 degrees centigrade in a cryostat. Cut 5 micron, 4 to 5 micron thick slices and stain with the hematoxylin and eosin stain. Don't use toluidine blue stain. After control freezing, transfer this sample into the 10% neutral buffer formally. And also don't use the liquid nitrogen for freezing. Now, once the slide is ready, what we should expect or what we should look for during the frozen section. There are four or five things we need to be carefully look during the frozen section. The first thing is the steatosis. Second thing is the necrosis third is the portal and the lobular inflammation, fibrosis and any other findings if present. The first, the steatosis, that's the one of the most 
important thing we should consider while doing the frozen section for the liver the why because the moderate to severe steatosis is associated with the adverse outcome during the early transplant period including the graft dysfunction or non function it is thought because once you have a once the surgeon anast do the anastomosis of the vessels and the blood passes through this the fatty liver the fat from the hepatocytes comes into the sinusoids and it causes the sinusoidal obstruction and the endothelial injury so many times once the graft this failed and we do the allograft uh, examination of the this failed allograft sometimes we we'll see that the large fat droplets within the sinusoids that's known as the lipopeliosis this is the example or the microscopic slide of the lipopeliosis where the fat extrudes extrudes from the hepatocytes and it fills into the sinusoids how do you estimate the fat usually we we'll grade the steatosis in a mild moderate and severe category mild is up to 30% moderate is 30 to 60% and severe is more than 60% of hepatocytes affected with the steatosis what are the risk factors for the steatosis macrovascular one is alcoholism diabetes mellitus hypertension obesity patient also on some drugs like amiodarone methotrexate steroid malnutrition anorexia these are the risk factor for the macrovascular steatosis so in the frozen section what we see usually we will see concentrate on a macrovascular steatosis and the large droplet so we'll see step by step what is the difference between the large droplet steatosis and the small droplet steatosis the large droplet steatosis means the fat droplet should be large enough to push the nucleus at the periphery and the fat droplet should be more than the size of the normal hepatocytes that's the definition of the large droplet fat what is the definition for the small droplet fat means this is the small droplet fat it should not push the nucleus to the periphery and the size of this droplet is smaller than the normal hepatocyte the hepatocytes are distended and having a foamy appearance usually this is a usually we see in cases of acute liver failure so in therefore it is unlikely that we usually will see such kind of liver during the transplantation again this photomicrograph shows the small droplet and the large droplet steatosis the green circle is marked with a large droplet fat this fat size or the droplet size is larger than the this normal hepatocytes so this blue circle is marked of the normal hepatocytes and we have to compare the size of this fat with this normal looking hepatocytes this orange circles are marked with the small droplet fat so how do you calculate the steatosis or what you consider or how do you approach the steatosis as per the bomb 2021 22 update only the large droplet fat should be used for the determination for the liver suitability for the transplant and it should be done with a three step process so what is the first step you assess the on the low power examination the overall percentage of the biopsy affected by the steatosis so put on the 4 4x or on the 4x scanner on microscopy you assess the entire biopsy and approximate and put the approximate percentage which is affected by the steatosis so the area which looks white on a low power examination that's mostly affected with the steatosis so you put the approximate area affected with the steatosis on a low power examination then on a second step the high power assessment of this fatty area or whatever of fatty area we have seen on a low power examination go to that high power on this area and carefully examine what proportion of cells in this area contain the large droplet fat and the last step is adjust the low power percentage or the according uh, as uh, as per the calculation so the total percentage of large droplet fat is equal to high power percentage of the low power percentage 
so so this is the exam example so this is the scanner view of the liver biopsy here on the scanner view approximately the 42% of the area is affected looks like fat or a stand out white so then the next step is go to the high power and in that area estimate the what percentage of the cells having large droplet fat the another method is a simplified average of fields method in which we divide the core biopsy into the approximate 10 uh, equal parts and calculate the uh, uh steatosis as per the above described method from first we'll see the low power then we'll go to the high power estimate the fat in the each part then do the average so both has a good concordance whether it is a simplified average field of method or a bounds method what do you see whether you mention uh, calculate the percentage of cells affected by the fat or the percentage of area so in this photograph it is clearly shown that the as the size of the fat droplet increase the area is increase affected by the steatosis is increase so in this example if you see the six out of 16 cells are showing the fat which is approximately 37.5% but if these six cells having the large droplet fat then approximate steatosis percentage comes around 54% so the slightly majority of the pathology assess the steatosis based on the low power global assessment without an high power assessment to determine what proportion of the fatty area actually contain the large droplet steatosis so are there any reference images are available yes the images are available and they are helpful to calculate the percentage of steatosis here this is the example of the one of the reference images while you can see this is first uh, picture shows around 1% fat second this is around 5% third this is around 10% so this images will be very helpful for the practicing pathologists who have just started to report the transplant or, or reported the uh, just started to report the frozen section of the liver so what are the factor affects during the frozen section for scoring of the steatosis first it's not the all the cells will have a large droplet fat or a small droplet fat there are the gradual variation of the size of the fat globules it makes it difficult sometimes to whether this should comes in the large droplet fat or a small droplet fat second thing it is difficult to find the boundary of the normal hepatocytes because in the frozen section it is difficult to recognize the cell membrane clearly the third there is a saline and the drying and the freezing artifacts it hampers the actual percentage of the steatosis calculation and last if you cut the very thick section on a frozen section like more than 8 to 10 micron then you underestimate the severity of the fat or once you cut the very thin section two or three micron then you overestimate the fat percentage the next thing you look for the portal and the lobular inflammation and fibrosis if it's present so in most of the liver biopsy which comes for the frozen section you will find the some degree of portal or the lobular inflammation so portal and lobular inflammation it's not the absolute contradiction to take that graph for the transplant the thing if you find the all the portals showing the extensive inflammation with interphase activity or the lobules are also showing the extensive inflammation with associated with necrosis then maybe this graph may not be suitable but mild portal or lobular inflammation it's not the absolute contradiction this is the example of the portal inflammation here there is a portal is expanded with the inflammation this photo micrograph shows the bile duct showing the um, uh, inflammation and this is a lobules here which is also showing the inflammation in which the inflammatory cells are there within the lobules third thing what you necrosis this is the one of the most important thing 
the necrosis defined as a usually we will see as a coagulated necrosis it is associated with a very minimal inflammation and usually we see in the pericentral or in the zone free location usually this is common when in a donor who has received the cpr or had a prolonged hypotensor or on a high dose of vasopressin the necrosis is extremely important because the pericentral necrosis is a predictive of the graft failure when more than 10% of the liver area is affected with the necrosis usually this graft is not suitable this is the example of the frozen section how the zone free necrosis will look if you see carefully this is a normal area and here this area this is the central vein this area is near the central vein so this is zone p and here there is a this large area of the hepat uh, area which is devoid of hepatocytes so this is showing the confluent necrosis in zone this is the permanent section of this here this is the central vein and this is a necrotic area artifacts they are very common usually saline and the drying artifact so how do they look the saline artifact looks like this where the hepatocytes becomes revealed and booking it hampers the drying artifact this drying artifact this uh, image shows the drying artifact it makes the liver biopsy uninterpretable for are also very common in liver biopsy what pigments usually we see in liver biopsy uh, lipofuscin bile and the iron how does the lipofuscin looks lipofuscin looks as a fine granular uh, deposits in the cytoplasm of the hepatocytes and especially they are seen along the zone three it has no clinical significance and they are known as a wear and tear pigment especially this uh, lipofuscin pigment helps to localize the zone 3 and it should be distinguished from the bile so how the bile will look bile is a coarse yellowish or greenish pigment they are there within the hepatocytes or they are there within the canaliculi so bile is always the pathological so canalicular bile is a will help to distinguish the uh, this pigment from the lipofuscin this is another photo micrograph here on the left hand side we'll have a fine granular lipofuscin while here there is a porta associated and inflammation and we'll have a coarse yellowish dark yellowish or greenish bile pigment is there here again this is fine brown pigments are the lipofuscin while this arrow marks the bile pigment Sometimes you will have a peri-biliary hematoma or biliary adenoma or metastasis. So this is the how the granulomas will look with the axial central necrosis, and the sample should be taken for the fungal and the tuberculosis workup while you find the granulomas during the frozen section. Next thing will be the focal nodular hypoplasia. It is a incidental finding and usually it is a discrete subcapsular isolated mass will be there it's usually around 1 to 3 cm but once you take the section it just looks like the cirrhotic liver because you know on the microscopy you have a multiple uh, nodules separated with the fibrous septa but once you communicate with the surgeon that it looks like cirrhosis but the surgeon will tell you no there is only the single nodule the rest of liver is normal 
so then it's a diagnosis of focal nodular hyperplasia and it is known as the contraindication for the trauma then the peribiliary hematoma or bile duct adenoma it just looks it just looks like the metastasis but you need to be carefully go to the higher power examine the ducts and the sinus they don't have any atp or mitosis or hyperchromasia and this nodule is well demarcated and well circumscribed you will find the fibrous sept and this will not communicate to the biliary tree so circumscribed nodule filled with the small sni and ducts fit in between the fibrous stroma this is known as the bile duct adenoma Uh, is it seems that there is some uh, uh, disconnection um, so while we are waiting for the uh, team to fix that we'll take some questions so uh, dr uh, uh, lipika although you have answered the questions in the chat box uh, it for the benefit of uh, attendees on youtube also uh, could you uh, tell us what is the thickness of a ideal liver biopsy oh. Uh, sir, the meeting was recently stopped. Its lecture is not yet completed, sir. Yeah. So whenever you restart, we will resume. In the meantime, while you are resuming, yeah, I am restarting resume. it right away, sir. Shall oh, I restart please. it? Yes, please. Yes, please. From the same point. Yes. It just looks. It just looks like the metastasis. But you need to be carefully go to the higher power. examine the ducts and the sinus they don't have any atp or mitosis or hyperchromasia and this nodule is well demarcated and well circumscribed you will find the fibrous septa or the edema in between so and this will not communicate to the biliary tree so circumscribed nodule filled with the small sni and ducts fit in between the fibrous stroma this known as the bile duct adenoma rarely the involvement of the lymphoma can also be can pick up on the biopsy in the scenario where the portal tracts are extensively infiltrated with the atypical lymphoid infiltrate and usually this scenario patient will have a abdominal lymphadenopathy is also so surgeon will tell you there are multiple nodes in the abdomen also then you should ask for the presence symptoms from the abdominal nodes also here rarely you may find the metastatic tumor especially the neuroendocrine tumors are also encountered now we'll go through the some case scenarios the first case is a cadaver is of the 40 years of age with the brain dead due to the cerebrovascular stroke and a and a, had a history of outside hospitalization for the 5 days the most recent liver function test the direct bilirubin is 1.4 ast alt alkaline phosphatase and ggt are uh, more or less within normal limit ggt is slightly elevated rest of all parameters are more or less normal this is the photomicrographs of the frozen liver this is a low power examination here you don't find see the any white or a fatty area this is again another low power examination on higher power examination you may find some vacuoles and these vacuoles are not uh, pushing the nucleus toward the periphery so it's more looks like the small droplet fat then you need to one of the portal tract is here it shows the mild inflammation this is the photomicrograph of the zone 3 here this is the central vein and this fine brown pigment is suggestive of lipofuscin so there is no uh, perivenular necrosis or drop out of the hepatocytes porta shows very mild or minimal inflammation rest of the hepatocytes here in a zone 1 and around the zone 3 do not show any significant large droplet fat so do we take this graft or not 
Yes. So this graph is suitable for the transplantation. So steatosis is less than 10%. Mild portal inflammation, zone three is showing no is absolutely fine, and fibrosis is F0. Another scenario of 40 year old male with the history of head injury due to the road traffic accident, no comorbidities, and last liver function is near normal. Again, the biopsy shows on the scanner view not much fatty areas. On higher power view, also not much fatty areas. No significant inflammation, no necrosis. So, Treatosis is less than 10%, no significant inflammation, zone 3, no necrosis, fibrosis is F0. So, this is also a good graph. Case 3. The cadaveries of the 60 years of age with a brain dead due to the CV stroke and had a history of hospitalization for 14 days. The most recent LFT shows elevated bilirubin around 6, with AST, ALT are also elevated around 120, 180. And alkaline phosphatase and GGT are also elevated around 200 and 190. So, on the scanner examination, you will see that the expanded porta with inflammation and some fibrosis. Here, you will see that the some fibrous print is coming from the porta. On the higher power examination, you see the dense inflammation in the portal tracts associated with the bilirubinous stasis or a bile stasis, here you will see the ductulitis and the ductular reaction. Again, another portal tract with the inflammation with the ductulitis and bile stasis. Another high power view showing some fibrous band and some small droplet fighting hepatocytes along with the extensive hepatocellular bile stasis and globular inflammation. Another one more area, here we will see the foci of necrosis. The hepatocyte dropout is clearly visible associated with the inflammation and there is a bile. So cholestasis, inflammation, necrosis and the inflammation is the present. Again, one more photomicrograph, large droplet fat, pile stasis, and mild inflammation. At places, you will see the hepatocyte dropout. So, finding steatosis is there, but it's not less than 30%. Portal inflammation, yes, present. Pile stasis, yes, present. Ductile reaction is there. Fibrosis is there. And necrosis is there. So, can we take this graph? So, the organ is not suitable for the stable recipient who can wait for the better quality graft. But this graft may be taken for recipient with an acute liver failure. So, it's not time the absolute contraindication, but it depends upon the condition of the recipient. If the recipient is stable, then we can wait for the better quality graft. But if the recipient has acute liver failure and he cannot wait, then this graft may be taken with the high risk consent. Another scenario, 40 year male, old male with a road traffic accident, broad dead with history of massive abdominal bleeding. The LFT says bilirubin is normal, but AST and ALT are marginally elevated, around 500 and 750. On a low power examination, usually there is not much fat in this biopsy. Some degree of inflammation is there. Some sinusoidal dilatation is there and condition is there. But one or two areas like this are showing the confluent necrosis and the areas of hemorrhage, sinusoidal hemorrhage. So confluent necrosis, sinusoidal hemorrhage, these are this suggests the ischemic changes. So steatosis is less than 10%, inflammation is mild. Necrosis, zone 3 necrosis with confluent necrosis present. So, graft is not suitable for the stable patient. But this may be suitable for the recipient with an acute liver failure with the high risk consent. Another example 
the 50 year female with the history of coronary vascular disease and having diabetes mellitus hypertension and obesity so on this scanner we will see the many majority of the biopsy shows the white areas or the fatty areas again on a medium power examination these are all the large droplet fat again on the high power examination these are the large droplet fat this large droplet fat size is more than the size of this normal looking hepatocyte and this fat this droplet fat large droplet fat pushes the nucleus towards the periphery so approximate percentage is coming around 50 to 60 percent no necrosis no significant inflammation so this graft is also not suitable for the stable recipient can wait for the better quality graft so the take home message is the liver with the malignancy severe microvesicular steatosis or extensive necrosis should be rejected if you cannot avoid the artifacts try to minimize them as two most important parameters steatosis and necrosis can be over or underestimated so saline and the drying artifact should be avoided as far as possible because they interfere with the interpretation of the steatosis and necrosis it should be keep in mind that the poor prognostic factors like steatosis, necrosis, inflammation can coexist in the same biopsy. For example, around 30% steatosis in an elderly donor with presence of zone 3 ischemic changes. This graft may not be suitable for the recipient who is stable and can wait for the better graft. But while this graft may be taken for a patient who is in acute liver failure. And finally, the compare the frozen and the paraffin section and any major discrepancy communicate immediately. Thank you, this Dr. Milab. This is the reporting template what we use for the uh, frozen section reporting of the liver biopsy. Here you need to be whether we'll have a needle biopsy, wedge biopsy. Then this is a large droplet fat. Usually we don't put on uh, report the small droplet fat, but usually we'll uh, in this template we'll put uh, apart from the large droplet fat we'll put the percentage of the small droplet fat also. Then the fibrosis, then the portal infiltrate, then the central lobular necrosis, cholestasis, active lobular inflammation. So whatever is present, we can just take mark and grade accordingly. These are certain references. Yeah, we can stop the presentation now. So, uh, thank so you very much, Dr. Dr. Milap, also. The... Uh, we were, unfortunately, we are very close to the 7.30 cutoff mark. So, we'll take the questions that are there on YouTube as well as here. And it will. I request both uh, the panelists, uh, the speakers, to be very, very brief in their answers. So, uh, the first is for Dr. Lipika. What is the ideal thickness of a biopsy? Ideally, we should uh, have a 3 to 4 microns thick. Okay. Whenever possible, because th thicker sections uh, will interfere in interpretation. And there is a question from Dr. Sanjeet Singh, which is better, retic stain or empty stain? Without doubt, empty. Because reticulin, first of all, cumbersome. Hai. It is difficult to perform a good reticulin stain. And moreover, empty in empty, you can appreciate other morphologies as well. I find interpretation of steatosis easier in empty stain than in h and &E interpretation of uh, interface activity, empty is better. Uh, one question for Dr. Milab from Dr. Khushbu Agarwal. Sir, uh, what is the role of oil redo stain in frozen section for steatosis? Usually, sir, we don't use this stain. So it is a, uh, it will not give you the correct idea. So the thing is that the only the H and B good quality hematoxylin used in stain is the ideal thing, and the section thickness should be around four to five microns. So not too thin, not too much thick, and no artifacts. So that's the ideal thing. And another question from Dr. Sanjeet Singh: Should uh, be uh, should the fat cysts be added in calculating fat assessment? Sir, it's a difficult. So usually you need to see the entire biopsy that the fat cyst may not, may not cover the entire core. So that's why. So if the, you need to see the both the cores from the both right lobe and the left lobe, compare the uh, uh, and calculate the overall percentage. 
because that first it may be misleading or represent the overestimation of that so it's ideal to see having the at least four cores from both two from the right side and two from the left loop then only we can get the correct picture and then extension to the previous question uh, in uh, you uh, talked about oil uh, redo but what about sudan stain for uh, steatosis is it the same thing yeah sir no, no stain except h and d stain no no other stain should be used. So two questions which are in clinical situations from Dr. Vachan Hukeri. One is if there is, uh, what is the cutoff for organ uh, acceptance or rejection based on fat, inflammation and necrosis? Do you have a percentage? So if you say that the large droplet fat is more than 60%, then it is the absolute rejection. Confluent necrosis involving the liver more than 10% of the core biopsy area, then also absolute rejection. So these two, and third thing is the malignancy. So these three are the absolute criteria. But the thing we need to understand is that the, even the 30-40% of fat can hamper the, can create the problem. So it depends upon the fat, necrosis and inflammation. We need to see the all three components together along with the clinical findings. So always we need to discuss with the surgeon because they have the correct idea. The metabolism or the a risk factor for the donor like the obesity, diabetes, alcoholism, any vasopressin was there or not. So it's not only the microscopy. We need to have a very good communication with the intensivist, anesthetist and the surgeon to come to the conclusion whether we can take the graft or we can reject. Sure. Uh, one question for both of you. This is from Dr. Jay Pandey. Uh, what is the ideal transport medium for a regular biopsy and what for a frozen section? So ma'am first. Liver tissue core wrapped in wet saline tissue. No uh, water, no saline, nothing. No formalin? No, no. For frozen uh, section, no, 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 not at all. No, no, no. For regular one also and for oh, frozen? Regular also. is formalin. Correct. Okay. Formalin and only formalin. And for frozen, Dr. Milab? Yeah, it's the same. So ideally, if you, are, uh, if you say the sample will reach within the lab within 15, 20 minutes, so nothing should be added. If you are having the transport time is around 30 to 40 minutes, then maybe only the moist gauze or it should be used. It's not the gauze which is dipped in the large amount of saline. So only the it should only make sure that the biopsy should remain only the moist. That's the most important thing. So it okay. should not uh, evoke the drying artifacts. One question for Dr. Lipika. What is the difference between feathery degeneration and ballooning degeneration? Both of them can look the same, but we use the term ballooning for hepatic pathology. That is enlargement that occurs due to inflammation. Feathery degeneration is used for cholestatic pathology. Here you can demonstrate cholate stasis within the feathery uh, hepatocytes. As I said, if you do arsin, you can find cola color granules. They are mostly found in the periportal areas. Both can look the same, but you have to see in which context you are using the term. And what's the difference between cholestasis and um, cholatestasis? This is from Dr. Sachin Chaudhary. Cholestasis is accumulation of bile in the hepatocytes and canaliculi, cholestasis. Prolonged cholestasis can cause cholate stasis, that is accumulation of bile salts in the hepatocytes. Cholate stasis is bile salts. And uh, uh, Dr. Milap, uh, is it possible to comment on the ex uh, exact stage of fibrosis in a frozen without special stains? Uh, it's difficult, but it's easy to identify the F3 and the F4 fibrosis. So it will, so F0, F1, it's they are the not the absolute contradiction for the uh, for the organ rejection. So it's it's good, it's fine that it's F1 or a very thin, small fibrous septa coming from the portal tract. That's fine, acceptable. Or even a thin bridging also acceptable with the some perforation. So, but it's extremely difficult. But we can easily make out F3 and the F4 fibrosis on a frozen section. So, F1 fibrosis, F2, it's difficult, but still acceptable. There are two questions which I which, which I think even I can answer. But uh, one is uh, how can we differentiate between sinusoidal dilatation and my macrovesicular steatosis? So please take them, but uh, <laughs> this is an easy one. Mm -hmm. Dr. Milab, you would like to answer? Madam, go ahead. 
sinusoidal dilatation the space uh, sinusoidal space is in between the hepatocytes and they are lined by endothelial cells dilated sinusoids will have endothelial lining macrovesicular steatosis is accumulation of fat within the hepatocytes and they are globular uh, they will have hepatocyte uh, they will be within hepatocyte sinusoid and hepatocytes are two different things in liver and there was one question whether or not uh, colonic malignancy is a contraindication for transplant so i'll answer that question um, if you allow so uh, if it's a active malignancy either in the donor or the recipient then it is a contraindication to liver transplant and the next question is uh, from Dr. Sonal Jain. How to differentiate freezing artifacts from steatosis, Dr. Milab? It's a difficult to think. So that's why. So freezing artifacts can evoke the small droplet. It just looks like the small droplet fat. But uh, we don't consider the count the small droplet fat while the calculating the actual percentage. So we should only calculate the LDF. So large droplet fat. We should also only consider while calculating or uh, uh, while uh, considering the fat estimation, not the small drop rate fat. So this was also the question from uh, Dr. Bulakshmi, and the, which has been answered. Now another question is um, uh, uh, Dr. Sonia Agarwal: Is cholestasis and feathery degeneration same term, Dr. Lupika? Feathery degeneration are the changes that occur in hepatocytes in cases of cholestasis. So that's the morphological term that we use to describe the change that occurs in a hepatocyte, which is enlarged in the process of cholestasis. I think we've covered everything. I hope I, we have not missed any question, but uh, you know, for the benefit of all the participants, we are planning a hands-on uh, workshop where you will be able to see all these slides, interact with all the specialists during the annual ISOT conference, which is going to be in Ahmedabad this year. And absolutely um, thankful to all of you for having attended the meeting today and also uh, having, uh, 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 you know, uh, thank you, Dr. Lipika and Dr. Milab and to Dr. Anish, Dr. Uh, Manish, who organized it and to Dr. Vivek Kute, who the secretary of the society for having organized it. So with everybody's support, this is a great beginning to this course. And we are going to have sessions every month. And at the end of it, uh, all of uh, you will be eligible to get certificates. Mind you, uh, you know, we are uh, maintaining the attendance of this. So please attend all the sessions uh, for the eventual certification. Thank you very much, everybody. And thanks, Thank Dr. Lipika. Thanks, Milap, in particular. Thank, Thank you. you.